My name is Hector Castro, and I'm the Director of Communications for the State Department of Agriculture. In just a few moments, we'll begin by sharing some background information on the gypsy moth, an invasive species that is among the most damaging pests in the United States. We'll share what we found during last year's trapping season, why this is such a problem, and a proposed project to eradicate the gypsy moth in the areas where it's been detected. You're going to hear from those coordinating the response and others from organizations concerned with the damage the gypsy moth can cause in our forests, the environment, not to mention the trees in our backyards and community parks. Feel free to submit a question at any time via the questions chat box on the GoToMeeting website. We'll answer your questions at the end of this presentation. You'll experience the best quality by closing other programs on your computer and only running the webinar if you can. If you have any problem viewing the webinar or hearing the presenters, call the number for GoToMeeting. So speaking today will be Brad White, Assistant Director and Head of our Plant Protection Division, Jim Mara, who's Manager of, our, of the Pest Program, Randy Taylor, also with the Pest Program, Barbara Morrissey with the State Department of Health, Office of Environmental Health, Raquel Crozier with the Washington Invasive Species Council, Bob Buzzo with the Washington State Nursery and Landscape Association, Mike Orjong with the Washington Forest Protection Association, Clinton Campbell with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and Carla Salt with our, uh, our Gypsy Moth Outreach Coordinator. So now we're going to start with our first presenter, Dr. White, who will provide some background information on the Gypsy Moth. Thank you, Hector. Uh, gypsy moth is a non-native invasive forest pest that poses a significant risk to the environment and the economy of Washington State. The native range of this insect extends from the west coast of Europe all the way across the continent to the east coast of Russia. You will hear us refer to both European gypsy moth and Asian gypsy moth during this webinar. It's the same species, but there are two varieties and the difference and importance in those varieties will come up later in the presentation. Both varieties of this uh, insect were trapped in Washington State during the summer of 2015. Gypsy moth is a severe forest defoliator, and that's why I worried about both varieties of gypsy moth. This is the kind of damage that they saw in New Jersey last year caused by the European gypsy moth. I'm not advancing. We have another defoliation picture here for you. Thank you. And as I mentioned, European gypsy moth is established in the eastern United States, and you can see the extent of the spread there. Um, Asian gypsy moth is not established anywhere in North America. And one of the interesting things about this map is that the spread of this insect uh, took place from one introduction. And in Washington, we have 10 Asian gypsy moths picked up during the 2015 uh, trapping season. So our hope is that our uh, projects prevent the establishment of both the European and the Asian variety. And we have some other folks here today who can tell you more about how we hope to accomplish that. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Dr. Jim Bear. Thank you, Brad. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, some of the life stages of the gypsy moth um, over the next couple of minutes. The slide that you see before you is the uh, caterpillar stage. The gypsy moth has four distinct life history stages, the eggs, eggs, the larvae or caterpillar, the pupil stage, and the adult stage. The caterpillar stage is fairly distinctive with its five pairs of blue dots and its six pairs of red dots. It has uh, hairs all along the length of its body. Um, the larval stage is the feeding stage of the gypsy moth and therefore the most destructive stage of the gypsy moth and it is the stage that we target during our eradication program which I'll talk more about in a few minutes. Uh, the hair along the body is uh, to be avoided in uh, contact because some people do react, uh, ha have an allergic reaction to the caterpillar. The next slide is uh, the adult stage of the gypsy moth. 
Uh, the jet propelled stage generally isn't as distinctive as the caterpillar stage. There are a number of uh, moths that are here in Washington that it could be easily confused with. As you can see, the male and the female are a different size, color, and shape. The female is the white uh, gypsy moth. The male is the dark brown. The adult stage is a non-feeding stage that only lives for several days. It can be identified by the distinctive uh, chevron pattern that of dark lines that run along the width of the wings. Uh, the photo you see in the next slide is the egg masses. The egg masses are the overwintering stage of the uh, gypsy moth. They contain anywhere from several hundred to over a thousand individuals in a single egg mass. Uh, as the overwintering stage, it uh, lives about nine months from the fall uh, to the winter. Generally, uh, um, adults uh, larvae emerge uh, sometime in mid-April in Washington. Uh, they're generally brown colored, light brown colored, and these are the stage at which gypsy moths are most often introduced into Washington State. Um, very often attached to outdoor household articles such as picnic tables, bird houses, uh, sometimes nursery stock, recreational vehicles are all means by which gypsy moth is introduced into Washington State. Now, uh, as I indicated earlier, the adult stage is often confused with some of the other stages, and sometimes we get dozens of calls that every year uh, reporting gypsy moth, and uh, that turn out to be another different kind of moth. For example, the tent caterpillar moth and the fall wet worm moth are often uh, reported to us as being gypsy moth, even though they are native species that are very common and widespread in Washington State. So if you see these tent-like structures in uh, some of your backyard trees, uh, they're either the tent caterpillar, if you see them in the spring, or the fall wet worm, if you see them in the fall, but they are not gypsy moth. And generally not nearly as destructive as gypsy moth, so our agency does not have any uh, programs to combat these insects. Now, the Asian gypsy moth and the European gypsy moth are actually the same species, but they're different varieties. And as different varieties, they, different have, they have different life history characteristics. Some of them uh, which are very important to Washington State in particular. Now, one of the most important characteristics is the flight capability of the female Asian gypsy moth, which has reported uh, to fly over 20 miles, which means it can spread much quicker and become established much more easily than the European gypsy moth. The females cannot fly for the European gypsy moth and has greatly slowed its progress. The other factor that's really important to our state is how well Asian gypsy moth does on evergreen trees or conifer trees. The uh, Asian gypsy moth is quite capable of defoliating Conifer forest, which is very important to us here in Washington State, since most of our forests are composed of conifer trees. And conifer trees are much less resistant to defoliation than are deciduous trees. One of the other characteristics is that Asian gypsy moth has not established anywhere so far in North America. And the European gypsy moth is not currently established in Washington State, although as indicated earlier, it is established in the northeast and midwest of the United States. Now, if, if gypsy moth were to become permanently established in Washington State, it would be a tremendous economic burden to our state. Uh, we would expect to see defoliation of events on a scale of several hundred thousand acres. So we would see large areas of defoliated forests in our national parks and our state parks and our wilderness areas. In addition to the uh, environmental damage, we would expect to see costly quarantines be put on our nursery industry, our Christmas tree industries, and our timber industries. These uh, would come in the form of uh, quarantines that would be very costly to these industries to try to export their goods to other states and other countries. Uh, with that, I'll turn over uh, the next part of our talk to Randy Taylor.
Thank you, Jim. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the gypsy moth trapping survey that Washington State Department of Agriculture has engaged in since 1975. The map that you see up there now depicts the uh, trapping for the summer of 2015. There's approximately 19,000 traps that were installed throughout the summer, 18,945 to be exact. Uh, the difference in color, the, the red traps represent standard detection traps that are set one per square mile throughout the populated areas of the state. The blue traps that you see there are ports and waterway traps, and while they're, uh, they're the same trap, they're set at a slightly higher density for the uh, increased risk of introduction Asian gypsy moth at the ports and waterways in the state of Washington. You can also see on this map that there are some, uh, some areas of yellow there. Those, again, are uh, slightly higher density traps that are set in locations where there have been previous catches of gypsy moth in the past few years. So the, uh, it's split about 50-50, the detection traps, roughly 9,000 of those, the port and waterway traps, 8,300, and the higher density traps at detection sites, uh, 1,600 of those. But this is a typical looking distribution for uh, the gypsy moth trapping program with one exception. There are no traps set in 2015 in the eastern part of the state of Washington. That was a decision that was made due to some uh, budget constraints and other, other programmatic decisions that had to be made. We will definitely be trapping eastern Washington in the summer of 2016 and in the foreseeable future. The, uh, the results of our trapping survey are shown here. We caught a total of 42 moths in the summer of 2015. Uh, Ten of those were the Asian gypsy moth variety that Jim talked about earlier. That's an uh, that's, uh, unprecedented number of Asian gypsy moth caught in one season for, uh, for our state. They were scattered about, if you look at the map, you'll see the, the boxes with the red text. Those indicate the locations where the Asian gypsy moth was caught. Uh, in addition, there were 22 European <coughs> gypsy moths caught in the city of Seattle in the Capitol Hill neighborhood. Uh, that area represents a reproducing population, and that, that site will be, uh, will be treated this spring as well. Jim will go into greater detail site by site a little bit later on in this, but this gives a, uh, a picture of, of what our trapping results look like. There are 10 scattered individual catches throughout the state. The, the plan for those catches is to trap next season at a little higher density and see if we can identify a population that may or may not exist in those cases. So um, the treatment methods that we consider when we're about to embark on a uh, eradication proposal are listed here. BTK, the first one, is the, is the method that we have chosen. Uh, the other five have all been considered by the U.S. Forest Service in their environmental impact statement. Uh, they've been disregarded for any number of reasons. Uh, Dimlin is a is a uh, more of a broad spectrum insecticide. It targets all uh, a wide range of, of beneficial insects, and it wasn't chosen for that reason. Gipcheck is a uh, is a virus that's that's very host specific, but it's not readily available. Uh, mass trapping is a technique that is sometimes employed. It requires uh, about 5,000 traps per square mile to be effective. And with the flight capability of the Asian gypsy moth, the amount of area that would need to be mass trapped to try and trap out all the adult male moths is just, uh, it's not feasible. So that was rejected as well. Mating disruption is a technique where uh, male pheromone is dispersed into the, into the area in an attempt to confuse the moths to prevent mating, and it is a not a proven eradication method, and more importantly, when you have that amount of pheromone in the atmosphere, the, the next summer's trapping survey is virtually useless. You have to, you're blinded for a year, and we simply don't have the luxury of time to, to uh, go, go a year without, without a trapping survey. So that was rejected as well. Uh, sterile insect release is a technique that's uh, not widely used for eradication. It's fairly experimental, 
and it's it's not appropriate for for the situation that we have either. So that leaves us with uh, BTK as our as our preferred method. BTK has a long successful history with gypsy moth programs nationwide. It's a naturally occurring bacterial insecticide. It has a proven safety record for humans and animals. It's specific to the caterpillar, uh, so it will not harm other beneficial insects, and it's safe for birds and bees and fish and plants, etc. It's uh, it's also certified for organic use on crops. Uh, so that's the method that we've chosen. Um, Barbara Morrissey from the Department of Health will talk a little bit later in more detail about the uh, the human health aspect of BTK. And so with that, I will turn it back over to Jim to talk about some of the more specific treatment areas. OK, thanks, Randy. I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about our proposal for eradication uh, that's going to occur this year. Uh, when it became apparent that we were having an unprecedented situation here in Washington with respect Uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture formed a technical working group of nine subject matter experts from around the country to make recommendations to Washington State as how to respond to the Asian gypsy moth catches. And so what you see here on this slide is our proposal for eradication that follows the recommendations of the technical working group. We are proposing to treat six um, Asian gypsy moth sites where we caught Asian gypsy moths in a single European gypsy moth site. And I'll just spend the next few minutes to briefly go over each one of the site locations to show you the treatment area that we are proposing. Now, uh, what you see on the left is our proposal for treating uh, Capitol Hill. Our, um, our boundaries uh, uh, encompass about 130 acres. Remember, we caught 22 moths at this site. This is the fourth consecutive year where we've caught gypsy moths, so this population has been brewing for some time now. We also found egg masses at the site indicating a reproducing population is present. So it's very urgent that we treat this site this year to prevent any further spread of the gypsy moth population in this area. The next site is Gig Harbor, where we caught an, well, a single Asian gypsy moth. Uh, this site is uh, just across Puget Sound from the Port of Tacoma where we thought uh, the introduction initially occurred. We have a cluster of catches in the Port of Tacoma and we view this particular catch as part of that cluster of catches that came in through the Port of Tacoma. So, so too we think it's very important to treat uh, this site as well. The next site is uh, Kent. Uh, we caught two Asian gypsy moths at this site. And we're proposing to treat, again, a one square mile area around, centered on the two catches. And it's mostly an industrial area. And um, on the right is the uh, Lacey treatment area. We caught two moths in uh, South Puget Sound, one in Lacey and one in Nisqually. And I'll show you the Nisqually catch in just a minute, but uh, again, Lacey will uh, treat one square mile centered on that catch, which is an area just north of I-5 there. On the left is the squally. This catch, that, uh, and again, a single Asian gypsy moth was caught just about three and a half miles from the Lacey catch, which is just northwest of this catch location. You can see it's just south of the uh, I-5. And again, we treat one square mile around uh, this catch location as well. On the right is the Port of Tacoma, where we thought, where we think uh, this introduction initially occurred. We caught four moths in this area, and the recommendation was to draw a treatment boundary around all four site locations. And this amounts to about a 7,000 acre area, which we are proposing to treat as well. Uh, the last site is uh, the port of Vancouver, where we caught a single Asian gypsy moth. This is an 800-acre site, which has a rather odd shape to it due to the fact that it's part of a much larger treatment area. In addition to our catches, 10 Asian gypsy moths that we caught in Washington 
Oregon also caught Asian gypsy moth. They caught two Asian gypsy moths in Portland, as well as two European gypsy moths. And uh, this is part of a larger 9,000 acre treatment area that extends into Oregon as well. So uh, this is part of the just the one single treatment area, this part of Vancouver site. So where do we go from here? From, from now on, we'll be monitoring um, a series of egg masses that have been placed in uh, certain locations around the state to determine the timing of the treatment. Uh, as I indicated earlier, we are targeting the larval stage for the treatment. Uh, when we spray BTK, it has to be consumed by the caterpillar in order to be effective. Uh, it is not a contact. Uh, pesticide. The caterpillar does have to consume uh, the BTK. So we'll be monitoring egg masses. Once the eggs hatch, then we'll be, uh, decide on the exact date of the first eradication treatment. When that date is determined, we'll go about notifying all re residents who, uh, who have requested notification through email, through text messaging, and through a uh, phone call system as well. So anyone wanting to uh, request notification uh, that could log on to our website, which uh, Carla will cover later on in the uh, presentation. Now, we will be conducting three treatments of BTK uh, at a minimum. Uh, if weather cooperates, we'll just limit it to three treatments. But if rain uh, happens to undo, uh, a, a single treatment, we'll have to repeat that treatment, and that's why we say we uh, may conduct three to five treatments. Uh, generally, these treatments are about four to ten days apart, uh, depending on weather. Then following the eradication of the treatments that we apply, then we put in a, a grid of high-density traps in order to evaluate the success of the treatment program, so we will uh, install these high density uh, trapping uh, for three consecutive years in the uh, treatment area to determine the success of those treatments. If we trap three consecutive years uh, without catching any moths, then we declare that site eradicated. Uh, now I will turn um, the rest of the program over to Barbara Morrissey. Great. Thanks, Jim. Um, so my name is Barb Morrissey, and I'm a toxicologist with the Washington State Department of Health. And I um, worked more than 15 years in our pesticide program where I followed up on pesticide-related illnesses across the state and educated people about how to use the safest methods of pest control. And um, today I was just invited to give about a five-minute overview on the safety of BTK for gypsy moth control in urban areas. So let's talk about what's in the BTK spray. Um, well, it contains a microbe called Bacillus thuringiensis kerstachii, or BTK for short. Um, it's a natural disease agent in caterpillars, so we're using nature to fight nature in this case. Um, this microbe becomes active and reproduces in the gut of caterpillars, but it has not been shown to cause infection in people or act as a human pathogen. Um, the microbe produces a toxin um, that is specifically toxic to caterpillars. So um, mammals, including people, um, we don't have the proper acidity or enzymes in our guts to activate this toxin. Um, we also don't have um, the specific receptor that a caterpillar has um, that the toxin reacts to. There's also some other ingredients, um, mostly water, but there is also sort of spent um, fermentation broth, um, which is what's left over of the food and the nutrients used to grow the bacteria. Um, it's primarily agricultural um, grains and things like that. There's also some um, uh, preservatives and some pH adjusters that keep the acidity right and um, keep harmful uh, bacteria from growing. Um, all the ingredients are approved for use on food, 
um, and Department of Health has reviewed the full ingredient list and concluded it was uh, of low concern for health. Uh, we cannot rule out that people allergic to certain foods or preservatives could plausibly react to these ingredients. Um, and in animal testing and occupational studies, it, the, the concentrated spray is slightly irritating to eyes and the respiratory tract. But overall, um, BTK has a good human safety record in urban areas, and in our opinion, it's the least toxic approach when moth control is needed. Next slide. Uh, I just wanted to highlight a couple of studies that support our conclusions. Um, there was um, a large um, spraying um, operation in Victoria, BC in 1999 over a populated area. And health researchers there did a number of um, observational studies to see if, um, even though they didn't expect to see symptoms, if any um, illnesses occurred, uh, they did a controlled study of children with moderate to severe asthma and did not measure any worsening of of the children's symptoms following the spray events. Uh, there was also no increased visits to healthcare providers for asthma, for respiratory disease, or skin reactions. Um, they couldn't measure any increase in symptoms of people that lived in the spray areas over people that uh, lived in areas that weren't sprayed, and, and uh, there were no infections in the general population due to the BTK. Uh, there was another uh, large spraying event in New Zealand in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Um, again, they did a number of studies to look for um, symptoms and other um, illnesses and, again, didn't see any increase in medical visits for a host of diseases. They also followed up on self-reported symptoms among residents but were unable to tie them specifically to the spray or to rule them out. And, and we saw the same types of symptoms reported here in Washington after aerial spraying in 1992 and 2000. Uh, a small percentage of people in the sprayed area reported mostly minor symptoms like eye, nose, and throat irritation or mild skin reactions, hay fever type symptoms. Again, we were unable to determine whether these just coincided with the spring allergy season or were related to pollen and dust disturbed by the planes and helicopters or maybe were related to the spray. Um, in animal testing, neither the BTK nor the formulated product is toxic to mammals except at huge doses. Uh, next slide. So bottom line, we do not expect infection or illness to result in the general population following spraying with the BTK uh, because we can't rule out that there could be symptoms related to allergy or mild irritation. We encourage people just to minimize their exposure to the spray droplets. So as a precaution, uh, we encourage people to stay inside with their windows closed for about 30 minutes to allow the bulk of the droplets to settle and then to let um, spray dry on the grass before allowing children out to play. If you do end up having um, you know, direct contact with the spray, you can wash it off with soap and water. Um, people with special health conditions or who, who, are, who are immunocompromised, have asthma, we think should just take special precaution to follow those guidelines. Um, and uh, we, we'd be happy to visit with, with you um, you know, in more detail or um, get some information to your doctor um, if you want to talk to your doctor about it. And that's it for me. I turn it back over to Jim. Actually, this is Carla, and I um, want to thank you, Barb. Also, we now have next up people from the community who are going to speak briefly about what um, the impact would be if Gypsy Moth were to become established in the state. We had anticipated having Raquel from the Washington Invasive Species Council. However, she was unable to make it, so we will go on to Bob Buzzer, who is with us from the Washington. Oh, you are? Hi, Raquel? Hi, oh, hi. sorry. Um, <laughs> wonderful. Well, we didn't see you on here, but we will love to give you a couple of minutes to talk about um, Gypsy Moth and invasive species in general. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, and uh, sorry for being tardy. My name is Raquel Crozier, and I'm the coordinator of the State's Invasive Species Council. 
Thanks for giving me a couple of minutes here. For those who aren't familiar with the Invasive Species Council, we were established by the legislature in order to provide coordination and policy support to the various entities doing invasive species management in Washington State. Um, we have a diverse group. We have members that represent state, local, federal, and tribal governments, nonprofits, as well as industry groups. And our members work on various species using a variety of techniques. But we're all united by two similar goals, and those are to reduce the impacts of invasive species on our landscapes, resources, and economy, and to minimize the overall costs of management. And when talking about reducing management costs, the invasive species managers that I work with talk a lot about the four categories or stages of invasive species management. And those include, uh, number one, prevention and early detection number two, eradication, number three, containment, and number four, long-term management. And of course, the goal of every invasive species manager is to stay in the prevention stage. Preventing a harmful species like gypsy moth from arriving and becoming established is, of course, the lowest cost solution. But early detection is our insurance policy if prevention fails. It can help us significantly reduce the likelihood of an infestation spreading further. While it's unfortunate that uh, gypsy moths have arrived here and our prevention uh, wasn't strong enough to keep them out, it's really fortunate that the Department of Agriculture's monitoring program was able to detect the species early. If we respond quickly and aggressively, we might still have a chance to contain the spread of gypsy moths, or even better, to eradicate them altogether. So quick and aggressive treatment means we can avoid the regular gypsy moth treatments, which are common in heavily infested areas of the Northeast. That's something we really want to avoid here in Washington. Gypsy moth poses serious risks to our natural resources. And um, the United Species Council is just really happy to see the Department of Ag, of Ag advancing with an appropriately aggressive plan for treating the infestation here, and um, also just the level of commitment to public outreach throughout the treatment process. So that's it for me, and, and thanks again for letting me say a couple of words. Thanks, Raquel. We appreciate you uh, getting on the line. Next, we have uh, Bob Buzzo from the Washington State Nursery and Landscape Association. Go, go ahead, Bob. Hello. Uh, my name is Bob Buzzo, and I have managed a 175-acre bare root seedling nursery in Olympia for the past 28 years. We grow approximately 4 million plants per season, both um, broadleaf and conifer material, and we ship these products throughout the U.S. and Canada. We are fortunate that the Department of Agriculture has been diligent in their tracking program so that we know that the gypsy moth is in the region. And at this stage, we do have the opportunity to control it. If this pest is allowed to establish itself in Washington State, it would spell disaster for nursery producers, such as a lawyer nursery. There would be severe restrictions on shipping plant material, and nurseries such as ours would not be able to survive with multiple markets in the U.S. and Canada closed to producers in a known gypsy moth state. These problems are trivial compared to the destruction of forest land and plant material throughout the state. There's also the, the risk to the environment and nursery personnel faced with the task of controlling another pest. And that's all I have. Thanks, Bob. All right, next up we have Mike Warjones from the Washington Forest Protection Association. I think his mic needs to be unmuted. Hey, thank you for that. I was talking to myself. Um, <laughs> thanks, Carla. I appreciate that. Uh, as you mentioned, my name, my name is Mike Warjon. I'm the director of forestry for Port Blakely and a member of the Washington Forest Protection Association. And I, I, it, the first thing I should do is really put some hard numbers around uh, Jim's earlier presentation. He said that there's a tremendous economic impact if the gypsy moths are allowed to populate our forests 
and I, I think uh, Washington residents would be interested to know that over a quarter of the state of Washington, of the entire landscape, is working forests. That is to say, forests that are producing uh, wood products. And uh, the jobs that are created in that working forest represent about four and a half billion, with a B, in wages every year. And so, you know, it's always surprising to me how many people don't know that. Um, and it's about 175, 180 million dollars in taxes. So those are kind of the hard economic numbers. But I think um, what, what's even more interesting is, uh, more on a personal note, for me, having been a forester in this state for 20 years, I am really interested in the health of the forest. I've been growing trees for a business essentially my whole life. And we are seeing unprecedented stress on our forests in the Pacific Northwest due to climate change. And you get high wind events, you get warm winters and, and dry summers, and, the, and those sort of compounding stresses are weakening the forest to the point where they're really susceptible to a lot of pests. And uh, the mountain pine beetle is a good example of that. You got 20 million acres in, in BC and, and uh, northern Cascades that's been decimated by the pine beetle. And um, what happens is you get these secondary effects. You get uh, bark beetles come in, um, other, other opportunistic pests, and ultimately you end up with a giant fire and the whole place burns down. And one of, one of our greatest gifts here in, in Washington is that we have this beautiful green forest that's cleaning the atmosphere and, and sort of filtering the air we breathe and providing all of these other intangible benefits. And when the whole thing goes up in smoke, it, it couldn't be more counterproductive. It's you know, exacerbating the problem. And so the good news, and frankly I'm relieved, um, is that in the case of gypsy moth, we have, a, we have a simple solution. It's the only pest really that we can easily control. And uh, one quick shot with a natural pesticide, and the problem's gone, and for this year anyway. And, and I, I echo everybody else's comments that I'm especially grateful that the Washington State Department of Agriculture uh, has spent the last 40 years holding the line on this, and they're doing a terrific job. And um, you know, we're, we're, we're very grateful for that. And, and the rest of the residents of Washington should be as well. And that's all I have to say. All right. Thanks, Mike. We appreciate your comments. And last up, we have Clinton Campbell, who is with APHIS, who's going to give us a little bit of the um, federal or national view on the importance of controlling gypsy moth. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Clinton Campbell with the USDA APHIS, and I'd uh, just quickly like to share kind of a big picture perspective. Uh, many of these points have been uh, mentioned already in passing, and I just have five things I'd like to cover briefly. Uh, number one, gypsy moth, whether it's the Asian or the European form, is a federal quarantine pest. Uh, and a quarantine pest is one that is economically important and is not present. Or if it is present, its presence is limited and it is being controlled. The, the first part of that definition applies to the Asian gypsy moth, and the second part of that definition applies to the European gypsy moth. Item number two, USDA APHIS views the 2015 catches in Washington and Oregon from a national perspective and sees the need to prevent Asian gypsy moth establishment in the United States. Item three, similarly, USDA recognizes the need to prevent European gypsy moth establishment in the West. Number four, Having either form of the gypsy moth established in the Pacific Northwest would mean plant damage, routine suppression of gypsy moth populations, and never-ending quarantines on forest and nursery products. And lastly, number five, Asian gypsy moth is not established anywhere in North America, nor is the European gypsy moth established in the West. And the objective is to keep it this way. I'll turn it back over to Carlo. Okay, thanks very much. Um, just moving on now, we appreciate um, people from outside of the agency taking a few months to um, help us um, get a, pers a broader perspective just um, rather than just WSDA. And I'm having a little trouble advancing the slide for some reason. Somebody. There we go. 
Um, so we're wrapping, we're wrapping up here. So I'm going to give you some more information about how you can learn more about the Gypsy Moth and stay informed. Wanted to let you know we do have the question box open. So if you have some questions that we haven't quite answered yet, go ahead and submit those, and we will do our best to answer those as we go along. Um, but first, I'm going to give you a little information about where you can learn more. First and foremost is to visit our website at agr.wa.gov slash gypsymoth. We're continually updating the website. In fact, I um, added an update to it just today, just a couple of hours ago. So that is the first place to go to get the latest information about our Gypsy Moth program and the proposed treatments that we have. Next, you can attend a live open house, which will be sort of a similar version to this, where you can meet some of the experts that have been on our webinar today. We are holding open houses in Seattle, Kent, Tacoma, Gig Harbor, Olympia, and Vancouver. Our first open house, live open house, is actually tomorrow in Gig Harbor. You can find the dates, directions, and all kinds of information about those um, open houses, again, on our website. On our website, you can also sign up for email alerts, which will give you lots of information about the Gypsy Moth, and as well as um, you know the latest information that's coming out, and when those treatments are going to start happening. We actually just today have the ability to sign up for robocalls or text alerts for when those treatments are going to happen. That's also on the website. We have a blog. Uh, where we talk about the different aspects of the pest program and the Gypsy Moth. We have, for example, one blog when we went out and set out sterile egg masses that it just gives you kind of a behind-the-scenes look about what it takes to run the pest program. You can, of course, always follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We have our Gypsy Moth Monday, which is a hashtag Gypsy Moth Monday, where we um, share new little bits and pieces of information about Gypsy Moth at least once a week so that you can stay informed about um, the dangers of this test. So um, just in conclusion, Gypsy Moth is a high-risk invasive threat to Washington's environment. It's very important that we continue to monitor and control this pest. And WSDA has been successfully doing that since 1977. Um, and we're going to get to this part shortly, but we're here to answer your questions. We understand that this is a very um, new and unfamiliar territory for many people. So we want to be able to answer your questions and put your concerns at ease. And once again, always visit our Gypsy Moth um, website for more information. So it looks like we have a few questions that have come in. Um, uh, Jim, why don't you take the first one? Will the BPK insect, oh, sorry, I don't think this is typed correctly, but will the BPK affect other species of moth? Uh, currently, yes, the uh, BTK will affect other species of moths, but only those species that are feeding at the same time as the gypsy moth in spring, for example. Um, the uh, tent caterpillar moth also feeds in spring, and some damage to the tent caterpillar could be uh, expected with a BTK spray. However, uh, studies have shown that native species do col recolonize an area to pre-treatment levels in about two years. Great, thanks. And only the second question we have, so if you have a burning question, make sure to type it in the question box quickly because we're just about to wrap up. But there was a question about whether the webinar is being recorded and whether it will be available later. Yes, it is being recorded and it will be available, guess where? On our website in about one week at the latest. It will be up there, available. So that looks like the last of the questions that have come in. We'd like to thank you for participating in this webinar. As I said, the recording will be available within a week. Um, we appreciate your help in helping us control this pest and preventing gypsy moth from becoming established in our state. Thanks and have a wonderful evening.